Okay, so for the next example, we are going to do the Lewis structure and 3D model of sulfur hexafluoride, so SF6. And the first step in the Lewis structure is, is we need to determine the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. So sulfur, there is one of them. Sulfur is in group six, so six valence electrons. Fluorine, there are six of them, each contributing seven valence electrons because fluorine is in group seven. And so we add these up, and when we are done, we need to make sure that this molecule has 48 valence electrons. So now we determine what our central atom is, and sulfur is written first, and we are surrounded by our terminal atoms, in this case, fluorine. And the third step would be to draw single bonds from your central to all of your terminal atoms. So we draw single bonds to all of our terminal atoms. Then we give our terminal atoms, the fluorines, an octet. And we know that fluorine wants eight, so I need to draw six more around each fluorine in order for each of them to have eight. Now, once this is done, I need to determine how many of the 48 electrons that I have drawn. And what I see is, is that I've used all 48 of my electrons. So, I know all the fluorines have an octet, but what about the sulfur? What I see there is, is with the sulfur, it actually has 12 valence electrons and not 8. But remember, when we are in period three or below, we can have expanded octets where we hold more than eight. So sulfur, it has at least eight. It actually has four more, and it can have four more because it's located in period three or below. So therefore, it has an expanded octet. So I've used all 48 of my valence electrons and everything has an octet. So we have the Lewis structure of sulfur hexafluoride. Now, in terms of generating a 3D model, we have to look at the central atom, the sulfur, and determine how many total regions of electron density are in around the central atom. So we see that there are six regions. And that narrows it down a bit in terms of what our geometry is going to be. But we have to take it a step further and look and determine what kind of regions of electron density are on the sulfur. And what we see is, is that they're all six bonding pairs. So therefore, that tells us that our geometry is octahedral. And with octahedral, we know that we have a bond angle of 90 degrees. Now, when generating a, Lewis, or a 3D model of an octahedral structure, what we have is our central atom, and we have two bonds that are in plane. Then we have two that go behind the plane, and two that come out of the plane. So this is the general structure that you use for anything that has six regions of electron density. So if it's got six regions of electron density, doesn't matter if it's six bonding pairs, doesn't matter if it's five bonding pairs, one lone pair, any combination. If you've got six regions, this is always going to be the general structure. So for our particular example, we have our two in plane, two behind, and two coming in front. So we put our terminal atoms in. And remember, we don't include our lone pairs on our terminal atoms in 3D molecules. And we see that we have a bond angle of 90 degrees for all of these. So all of these six regions here are 90 degrees apart. And if we look at this, all of these bonds, all of these are equal in length. We don't have any lengthening because unlike the previous example where we had phosphorus pentafluoride, with this one, every bond angle is 90 degrees. So they do not lengthen from each other. They are equal in length. 
One additional thing to consider with this molecule is the polarity. And even though experiment 10 doesn't ask for it, you can look and see that with this structure, we do have polar bonds. So this means that we could have either a polar molecule or a non-polar molecule. So we have to determine, do I have a net dipole moment? So we have our polar bonds because we know sulfur and fluorine do not have the same electronegativity, therefore those electrons in that bond will not be shared equally. But then we have to look at the overall molecule itself. And we have to look and we say, do we have a net dipole moment? Do we not have a net dipole moment within the molecule? So if you recall back to the things that I taught you, there's little tricks to determine that. We look and see, okay, do I have a lone pair bonded to the central atom? And the answer is no, I don't. I don't have any lone pairs on the sulfur. So I keep going. Do I have any different atom bonded to the central atom? And I see that they're all fluorine, so that would be a no as well. And if I look at the 3D structure, I see that all of the bonds are 90 degrees apart. So what this indicates is when you have no's for all of those questions, you know that you are going to have a nonpolar molecule where you have no net dipole moment.